Good morning and welcome to the client side track. I'm uh, pleased to introduce this morning Robert Hansen and Josh Sokol with HTTPS Can Bite Me. And the speakers have requested that you hold questions until the end as they have a lot of information to go through. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. yes? Check. Excellent. Check. So, um, uh, yeah, my name is Robert Hansen. I run a company called Sec Theory out of Austin, Texas. I also run hackers and slackers. Uh, I also go by Rsnake. I'm Josh Sokol. I'm the information security program owner for National Instruments and uh, Austin OWASP president. So, um, the whole point of this presentation uh, is we're going to be talking um, about HTTPS and not the uh, client, uh, not the like VPN sort of types of SSL, not, uh, uh, not things that are embedded or, or whatever. We're just talking about the browser implementation of uh, HTTPS. Uh, so, uh, just setting expectations here. Uh, so, um, we are not going to be doing any demos uh, because, frankly, I'm, I'm scared of the demo gods. Um, and also, a lot of demos, um, you know, there's something to actually see. Well, with most man middle attacks, you don't really see anything. So uh, we went back and forth and we decided uh, we have way too much stuff to cover anyway. So uh, no demos. Uh, I hope that doesn't piss anyone off too much. But, uh, but you'll get a lot of good stuff. All right. So what's wrong with SSL anyways? So last year, 2009, uh, Teher El Gamal, the inventor of SSL, uh, was asked by a ZDNet reporter his thoughts on SSL man the mill attacks and the ability to intercept session cookies. And this is what he said. He said, I think all these problems have to do with browser design rather than security or protocol. It's interesting because SSL gets blamed for all the stuff but they are actually not even related to SSL. And while Robert and I agree that most of the issues are browser related, it's kind of unfair to ignore some of the SSL or TLS specific issues. So we get to this. You know, back in 1995, SSL 2.0 came out, numerous vulnerabilities. Adam Shostak had an article where he addressed uh, some of the uh, SSL ineffectiveness uh, at protecting user, uh, users once compromised. Uh, then comes along 1996, SSL 3.0 uh, from Netscape. Uh, IETF actually went, uh, built SSL 3.0, uh, and then later on TLS 1.0 in 1999. And then we go two more revisions since then, and uh, we still have issues with SSL and TLS. There are still flaws in it. So, Here's the promise of SSL and TLS. And, it, and it, it's good intentions, right? We, it's supposed to do good things. It's supposed to prevent eavesdropping and tampering. It's supposed to provide us with endpoint auth uh, authentication, communications, confidentiality. Those are all good things. Unfortunately, that's simply not the case. So we start out here, and, and this is how a user finds an SSL site. So these problems begin even before the protocol is actually negotiated. So the user goes, they type in HTTP www.bank.com and immediately we have our first issue which is a DNS lookup, right? We have to find our site. And that's in plain text. And then we get a response which is in plain text. And then we get an HTTP request which is in plain text. And then we have an HTTP response, again plain text, which gives us a redirection. Finally we get to the point where we're, we're negotiating. So there's a lot of space here for a man the mill style attack where they can actually intercept this traffic they can modify things before we ever get to the encrypted pages. And here's one of those tools uh, Moxie Marlin Spike uh, created. It's called SSL Strip. And basically the idea here is the man the mill can pull out secure re uh, links or redirects. And so if you're going to a website and you, uh, you're basically going to start off at an HTTP place and there's going to be a link on that page that's going to redirect you to some sort of HTTPS login page. Well, the problem is using SSL strip, a man in the mill can pull those links out. So here we see HTTPS loginbank.com. That gets changed to HTTP login.bank.com. And the thing, the, the thing here is the user is none the wiser, unless if they're actually checking for, you know, the lock or, you know, sometimes there's a background color change, something like that. Uh, so using a program like this, you're basically able to pull out all the stuff that, that a user would be able to use uh, to maintain that confidentiality. A user now has to explicitly type in HTTPS in order to get to the page that they want to get to. 
So now we talk about SSL renegotiation. This was found by Martin Rex and Marsh Ray, and this was found uh, late 2009. And originally this was dismissed as being too theoretical to actually do anything, and then this Turkish grad student comes out named uh, Anil Kurmus, and he actually creates a successful attack against Twitter, a fairly large site, right? And he basically does, a, uses the uh, authentication of a user and essentially does SSL renegotiation in order to steal the user's credentials. That's a pretty big flaw. And I, I want to note that this is a flaw in the TLS protocol itself. This is not a browser related flaw here. So there are issues here with SSL and TLS, the protocol, right? Uh, so the idea here is that an attacker inserts text at the beginning of an SSL stream with each negotiation. Flip to the next slide. So oh. <clears throat> um, there was a lot of noise uh, last year about uh, CNNIC, which is uh, the Chinese telco, or sorry, Chinese uh, root server, rather, uh, because people didn't trust China or whatever. But the irony is immediately above it is Chinhua Telecom, which is Taiwanese telecommunication. So uh, it doesn't really make sense. If you really don't trust foreign governments, you should probably should pay attention to what's in here. And there is a ton of foreign government uh, suits, certs in here. Uh, but most interestingly, in Firefox, Fox, uh, which a lot of hackers out there use, and a lot of that noise came from hackers, we've had the Hong Kong root, uh, root uh, cert in there for quite a while. So uh, it's just like, who do you really trust? And if you don't remove these people from there, you're implicitly trusting whoever owns these or whoever can subpoena them or tell them to give up those credentials uh, uh, with your security. So uh, Intrepidus Group uh, found a really uh, interesting example of how you could use, uh, leverage the resellers against uh, the, the person you're trying to man in the middle. So they attack Startcom, uh, this vulnerability is no longer there, uh, but using basically Burp proxy and changing one parameter, they were able to create any wildcard cert for any domain they felt like uh, just by having it email them instead of the actual SSL admin at whatever domain.com. So they had a couple examples where they took uh, PayPal and Verisign.com root certs. Uh, so it's pretty bad. So now we take this a step further, and in uh, late 2008, uh, Alex Sodorov and his team uh, came up with this thing uh, basically using MD5 collisions. And uh, they wrote a paper, it's called MD5 Considered Harmful Today, Creating a Rogue CA Cert. They used 200 PlayStations, and they took advantage of these uh, collisions. They uh, spent a few hundred dollars in new certificates, uh, and they found out this, this rapid SSL random number generator really wasn't random. And so on these 200 PlayStations, about one to two days or so, um, they were basically able to create a fully trusted uh, certificate from a man in the mill to read and tamper with the data. Uh, and all of the affected CAs have uh, switched now. They're no longer using MD5. They're using SHA-1 at this point or something better. Uh, but this was a big issue, right? Um, interestingly, uh, if you actually go into Firefox and you look at uh, which certs you have, uh, uh, Alex's and his team's cert is actually in your browser right now. Uh, it's just that uh, these two buttons, or three buttons or rather, are unclicked, which basically gives it no authority to do anything. Uh, but that was their solution. Rather than you know fixing some other, you know, revoking it or do something else to, to get rid of it, uh, because it is a collision with an existing certificate, they just uh, basically authorized it but took no, uh, gave it no authority to do anything else. So this story scares me, and it should scare you guys too. This was uh, broken by uh, Chris Sogam at the FTC. And uh, basically, they are selling a, a, an actual hardware device, and this device advertises that government agencies can compel a certificate authority to issue false certificates, or they can convoke uh, they can basically create their own certificates. They can covertly intercept and hijack secure web-based content using this, uh, this technology, right? So this is not a theoretical concern at this point. This is actual technology that is in existence. Uh, you can go out, pack up forensics, and you can buy one of these devices that will actually create certificates and sit in the mill. So this is likely an active use out there. You know, why would they productize it if it weren't being used? Yeah. So if you see this thing in your, in your network, you, you kind of know what's going on. Yeah. <clears throat> Be careful. Yeah. So uh, there's kind of a bunch of UI problems around it. I'm not going to talk about 99% of the UI issues. But uh, 
Uh, one example is, you know, fave icons. You know, a lot of people just say look for the lock. Well, that's very easy to get around. Uh, other things like iPhones, for instance, there's really no way to tell what you're allowing. Uh, in this case, it looks like you're allowing hackers.org, which you would never trust anyway. So it's like, okay, I'm not going to put any sensitive data in there to begin with. So sure, I'll trust the cert because I'm not going to, I'm not putting anything in there. Uh, what you're actually doing there is accepting Bank of America. It's an iframe that's, you know, it's, it's not telling you that it's Bank of America related, but, uh, uh, there's really no way for a user to identify the difference. <clears throat> there's a lot of bad user experience stuff out there. Um, you know, uh, this is Chrome's uh, you know document that you know w the, the warning you get when you get a SSL TLS mismatch error uh, with Bank of America. Um, and stuff like this, you know, Google Chrome can say for sure that you reach www.bankofamerica.com, but cannot verify that it is the same site as bofa.com, which you intended to reach. That is just the worst written sentence on the face of the planet. Uh, but uh, so if a user were actually were trying to figure out what was going on and they were actually reading these t this kind of type of text, which I'm sure no one has ever read, but uh, if you had, you would have certainly been very confused. Uh, here's another example uh, of just bad implementation. So uh, if you go to HBS colon slash slash uh, YouTube.com, uh, the YouTube SSL uh, TLS version of their website, uh, you'd expect to either see something that's SSL TLS related or get nothing, you know, if they didn't support it. Uh, but what you actually get is a SSL TLS mismatch error because they use a wildcard cert for Google.com. So they just apparently they have a single QA person looking at their port, open ports. It's a little weird, but uh, but also there's weird UI issues uh, within Firefox. For instance, it says permanently allow this exception, and that's by default. And it's kind of weird if you click it and if it it'll kind of stutter step and it'll actually check it again. So even if you kind of think you've unselected it, sometimes it'll reselect itself. So there's a lot of weird UI stuff uh, within the browsers. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that we're not going to talk about in this presentation. This is all just the history getting us to where we are today. Um, so SSL TLS uh, relies on unencrypted email, which sort of kind of defeats the purpose. Um, you, uh, for like uh, live.com has you know, any sort of webmail server, uh, you can get things like SSL admin at and you can get a wildcard cert for you know, live.com for instance. Uh, we're not going to be talking about that SSL rebinding stuff that Alex Sorgov and, and those guys uh, uh, talked about at CanSec West. Uh, really good technology. Just just kind of flips you back and forth. If you can't, afford, if the attacker can't get a, 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 a EB cert, they can get a lower class cert and kind of switch it back and forth. It, it kind of blinks really quick. Uh, we're not going to be talking about the negative UI issues. Uh, there's all, all Jake Graver did an, an excellent speech on this. Um, uh, I'm sure if you guys uh, ping him about it, he would give you all the information. Um, we're not going to talk about you know the questionable activity of delivering EXEs over HTTP um, that happens quite a bit. You know maybe they're signed, maybe they're not. Uh, what the value of that is or not. Um, we're not going to be talking about like I said before any things like iTunes or SSH or anything that uses SSL TLS as a library. We're just talking about the browser. Uh, we're not talking about si strict transport security. Uh, there's a whole bunch of problems with it, uh, but we're not talking about it. Um, we're not talking about how cookies are HTTP most of the time anyway. So, like Facebook, for instance, you, know, you log in securely, but your cookies are still over HTTP. So, a uh, bad guy can still log into your account just like they, you know. Um, we're not going to be talking about how cross site scripting breaks uh, the whole security model of SSL TLS much. Uh, there's a little bit of XSS uh, kind of near the end. Uh, so, uh, once upon a time, uh, there's a great book uh, uh, by um, uh, uh, called um, uh, what am I thinking? Bruce Schneier. Uh, yeah, Bruce Schneier's uh, book. What am I thinking? Jeez, <laughs> uh, it was a late night. Uh, it wasn't that late, but it was. I just didn't sleep very well. Uh, but uh, it's called Applied Cryptography. You might have heard of it. Um, and he had this example where he was saying, if you have a perfect crypto system, uh, there might be a chance where you can still infer stuff about what's going on. So his example was you have like a major who sends out some encrypted piece of information that you can intercept but you can't read uh, to a bunch of people, and those people then send similar messages or different messages, but maybe similar sized or something uh, to. Many other subordinate people, or potential, maybe they're not subordinate people, but you can sort of infer that there's kind of a chain of command. It might be just somebody who really wants to encrypt their their you know nude pictures to their buddies or something. But chances are, if you're talking about military organization, that's probably a, a hierarchical structure. Well, you sort of run into the same sorts of issues when you're talking about HTML. So HTML is sort of the thing you immediately get. You know, you know obviously HTTP above that. But uh, once you get an HTML document, it sort of makes a bunch, makes your browser make a bunch of 
requests. Things like JavaScript, which can actually ask for more JavaScript or images, for instance. CSS, which can ask for bindings or more images. Objects can ask for Flash or more images, and so on. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of sort of back and forth that the browser does that kind of leaks information if you're a man in the uh, man in the middle. All right. So uh, there's some major problems for an attacker to overcome when they're trying to mount one of these inference attacks uh, as man the mill. So to start with, you have ciphered content piggybacking on single sockets, which means that it's really difficult to tell where one one packet ends or one. Uh,